it's incredible to be here at the Center for Fiction. And if you don't know about this place, I really would urge you to look it up. But I want to say thank you so much for the Center for Fiction for having Grant and all these wonderful writers. Um, this is the third best American novelist. I'd like to point out that I was never in any of these. Which means, what's supposed to say that? Um, <laughs> I wanted to say a special thank you to the other judges of this issue, uh, this edition, I should say. Patrick DeWitt, um, Ben Marcus, and Kelly Link. Uh, and also a special thanks to Bill Buford and Ian Jack and Secret Rousing, who is the current editor and publisher of Grant. And Secret was so wonderful because, as I said last night, in theory, it's 20 writers. We had to pick 21, and we just we weren't going to give anyone up. There was a lot of pushing and shoving near the end. Um, what you will see in this wonderful collection is an incredible range of young voices. And really, uh, I think it, it captures a moment of where we are with America now, which is that some people are, are incredibly embracing the big, ambitious, great American novel, and other people are looking at things like a lentil. <laughs> And in the best of ways, and I think there's a lot to be said for that lentil fiction, which is going to really come to the forefront in the next couple of years. Um, but in all seriousness, no, there really is and a range of people who are working in very traditional ways of telling stories and incredibly experimental narrative. And it was so incredibly much fun to read. We only actually, judges only had to read 80 books, approximately. Uh, the folks at Grant read about 400. But there's something also wonderful, and I didn't get to say this last night. When you read a group of books by either a specific age group or a specific year in publishing. It's amazing to just see the range of voices and the kinds of ideas that people are looking at. So I think when you get a chance to read this issue, you'll also begin to capture that. And then of course you'll buy all the books by all the writers. Um, so I'm gonna, we have so many people reading tonight, I'm gonna jump right in and what's gonna happen is besides the lucky raffle, there's no lucky raffle, um, besides the lucky raffle is each writer is gonna get up sequentially and they will say their own name um, and then they will read. So it'll move things along. So our first writer tonight is Hallie Butler. Hello, my name is Hallie Butler. Um, uh, I'm used to reading to like uh, four drunk and slightly bored people at a bar. Uh, so it's nice to be here. <coughs> uh, I see a dog in the park. I see kids playing on the playground in their puffy coats. Parents or maybe nannies on the benches watching, talking. I walk the track over and over, thinking about my situation, assessing my life. Where will I go and what will I do? I almost feel like I'm flying, light and easy. I walk for maybe 40 minutes in this circle until a woman in a polo shirt with a whistle approaches me, smiling. How are we doing today, she asks. And I wonder if it's really that easy to get people to engage with you, if relaxing really is the key to socialization. I'm doing well, I say, not wanting to stop, feeling myself almost try to walk past her, but her stepping in the way of my path. <laughs> uh, me pivoting, slowing, reluctant. So we're doing okay today, she asks again. The tone in her voice has force. I recognize it as malevolent almost immediately. I start to get nervous. Yeah, we're doing fine today. And then it just says, ha ha, but that's not in quotes. Um, been doing a little bit of drinking today, maybe, she asks. <laughs> drinking, oh no, for sure not. I'm just clearing my head, going on a walk in the park, I say, then, like maybe it will make a difference, I point over my shoulder and say, I live right there. Seems like you've been walking around in circles and stumbling a bit for almost the past hour, she says. I notice a family in the playground behind her. The son throws a lackluster snowball, his puffed suit moving unnaturally, his mother watching with tight lips. I know she did this to me. Fuck you, I think. Fuck you. Stumbling, I'm not sure, I say. I had a long, stressful week at work and I'm just getting some exercise. It sounds completely reasonable to me as it comes out. The intonation is perfect. If we were on the phone with this kind of intonation, this kind of diction, I could get her to give me her checking account number, maybe some health details depending on the context. But we're not on the phone and the context here is pretty clear. 
She's in a white thermal under a baby blue Chicago Parks District polo, a whistle and a key card lanyard and those noisy kinds of jogging pants, fogged breath coming out of her, a tight and unforgiving braid almost at the crown of her head. And me in my brown men's overcoat with the lining hanging out of the bottom, sweatpants and cheap snow boots, though I would think she might respond to the sweatpants and find some affinity there. And my hair still clearly uncombed and freezing in parts from my shower, even though it's mostly underneath my dollar store stocking cap. The context is clear. If only I still had my glasses. It's amazing what a person can get away with when they're wearing their glasses. I imagine her getting a walkie-talkie call about me, the creepy, stumbling man-woman, and looking down at me from the window in the field house and deciding that she was just going to nip it, just come down here and take me out, get her done, as they say, and then her hustling down the stairs, body in full motion, a little articulation of the elbows, a little pneumatic pump of the arms. Nothing really that my ultra-smooth cadence can do to convince her of my innocence in the matter. Well, maybe you want to get your exercise somewhere else and you can come back to the park when you're feeling better. That's what she says. Um, I'm feeling fine, miss, I say, but I also don't want to cause any trouble. The feeling of relaxation in my body is so profound as I say this that I almost start laughing. I feel light. I feel like it would not be completely out of the realm of possibility for me to daintily raise my hand and give this park ranger a cupped and not too hard slow motion slap across her face. I find it odd that neither of us is leaving and neither of us is talking, and it makes me smile. Oh, yes, right, I say, remembering that I'm the one who's supposed to leave. She works here. I think, toodaloo, but don't say it, and I walk off towards Augusta, the opposite direction of my apartment. Possibly she thinks I was lying about living nearby, but this is one of those small things that everyone is always encouraging everyone else not to worry about. Thank you. I'm Joshua Cohen, and uh, I need to find what I'm reading. Uh, this is from a, a, a book of mine that's coming out in a little bit, and it's about these two Israeli soldiers who um, are just getting out of the army after their compulsory service, and they're going to come to the States and, and work as eviction movers. But uh, So it's a, it's a funny book. But this is, um, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is them still in the army. There were Palestinian police on the Palestinian side and Israeli police on the Israeli side. Your role as army was to police the police, to relay the irreconcilability of all their orders, to scan the plates, get the driver and all passengers out of the car, their arms and legs spread and hijabs off, put the mirror under the car like you're checking it for breath, check the trunk and under the hood, the interior, Check the fluids. You had to be at once a soldier, a grease monkey, and the angel of death. You had to be a brother and a son. Even after you were relieved and took your turn in the booth using a contraband cell phone to call your parents, who were slumped in a bunker underground, eating beastly, drinking coke, and squabbling, toggling the TV between Sport 5, carrying Maccabi Tel Aviv via FC Basel, and Channel 1 with its screen blue sky and the smoke of Qassam rockets crazing through like static. Occasionally, there'd be some Hasidic rabbinic or rabbi-esque figure bearing down the settlement road in his dove gray Mercedes-Benz 190 between the industrial zone and the settlement on the ridge above the shepherd village, and his windows would be downed, and with a shake of his payas, he'd be screaming at you for making him late. And the funny thing would be that every once in a while, the guy, because he was a Jewish transplant from America, would be doing all that screaming in English which Uri wouldn't understand, or would only half understand, and he'd speak to the guy in Hebrew, which the guy wouldn't understand, or would only half understand, and the guy would just keep shouting something in English so that Uri would have to get Yoav to moderate the languages, if only to keep from just slapping the guy, which was never advisable. Not because the guy was a Jew, or an American, 
or possibly an Israeli citizen or a Hasid who resembled a rabbi or possibly even a bona fide rabbi ordained, but because he was a settler. And as a soldier, Uri was basically his employee, basically his bodyguard. Occasionally, there'd be a protest to break up, to break up the monotony, Palestinian and even Israeli, but then occasionally there'd be a few Israelis out at the Palestinian protests and everything would get confusing. Then maybe there'd be some kid at some protest who'd maybe hurled a rock and you tried not to shoot him, even though your gun only had rubber bullets, even though you'd been so bored you'd spent all your day crushing the rubber bullets up into small, sharp pebbles so that while the rules would be respected and no laws would be broken, the skin would be, the skin would be pierced. In general, you tried not to hit kids and women, anyone who made a fuss if they were hit, journalists. Every once in a while, there'd be a midnight run through a village just to light it up, searching for someone or for no one, finding someone else or no one, going into a house to surprise the house behind it, to surprise the neighbors next door, taking the doors off and going room to room, herding a family into the kitchen, and then heading upstairs to ransack the closets and unscrew all the beds nut by bolt, slashing up the divan in the den and then sitting down on the framed remains to cruise the news on Al Jazeera or playing PlayStation or Wii, awaiting further instruction, awaiting intelligence, babysitting a son or brother bound to the divan with plastic cuffs draining him white and a drenched towel over his face keeping him cool until the interrogators came. On your way out, confiscating bangles for your sisters, candlesticks and goblets, checkered boards for every game involving kings. A woman keening in the kitchen to the pitch of boiling water. You shut her up with the butt of your gun. You butted a jug and it sharded apart into archeology span even before it hit the floor. The time after action was different from the time before. You couldn't wait to be sent into Gaza, but then once you got out, you could wait again forever. The wait to be discharged. Should you be feeling so impatient? The wait to get on with the rest of your spared life? Why be in such a hurry to get hustled and now have to pay for your own lodging, meals, and clothes? But still, the army dragged on with debriefings, memorial services, notching the days with a pocket knife on the shank bone of a lamb, which you were trying to carve into a dagger dribbling your shadow like a football across the half line, leaving your dead in the dust, running wretched behind you, running out the clock, fouling toward the goal. The very last days, the split begins. From thinking about the unit to thinking about the self, about yourself, about the resources available to you after the army. The scope of the imagination being circumscribed by family would reveal your family would reveal your finances, culture, class. Menachem started flipping through Harley Davidson brochures, wondering which bike to buy with the reward his parents were giving him just for finishing his stint. God started drifting off to lounge under a palm tree and reacquaint himself with the state of international poetry. Everyone was becoming de-equalized, each groping toward his individuality in a great dismemberment of a corpse. The amputation of shredded legs, rotems, the removal of ruptured spleens, drawers, and the pain Ori would come to feel would be like a phantom pain, as the spare parts of what had also been him went out stumping across the earth or were buried alone below it. Hi, I'm Mark Doten, and uh Thanks to A.M. Holmes and the other judges, to the center and everyone at Granta. This is really special. I'm going to be reading uh, my piece that's in here is the first chapter of a novel in progress called Trump Sky Alpha. I am going to read the first and last page of that chapter where Trump starts World War III. <laughs> Trump Sky Alpha, the rigid airship that docked on the roof of the White House and the roof of Trump Tower a thousand-foot vessel from the bridge of which Trump delivered streaming YouTube addresses every, every Wednesday, D.C. to New York, and every Sunday, New York to D.C. The ultra-luxury Zeppelin, Crystal Palace of the Sky, on which the 224 seats, luxury berths in an open loge style, went for a starting price of $50,000. 
a figure that jumped with the addition of various ultra deluxe packages and enhancements. Diamond and Diamond Troika Elite tiers, four figures for the 10-star double platinum seafood certified eight-pound lobsters with Trump embossed on tail fin and right claw. Wine pairings offered by the animated founding foodie Ben Franklin on touchscreen. Franklin adjusting spectacles and cataloging flights of Trump wine. An exquisite taste of Trump. The feu de cheminée and the blanc de blanc de la plus blanc. The <laughs> The final bill, after disembarkment running to 20 pages or more of often obscure fees and surcharges, bag fees and negative weather clemency credits and per-use charges on the ergonomic loge controls, every seat adjustment noted by the system and itemized, the seats arranged in an oblong spiral that looped the transparent floor six times, the entire body of the aircraft constructed from a revolutionary transparent membrane stretched over a skeleton of moth-white aluminum. And that sentence goes on for four or five more pages, but <laughs> we'll leave that aside and uh, get to the explosion things. And right there, he authorized it. There aboard Trump Sky Alpha, on the YouTube live stream, he authorized the big one, the biggest possible response. Lobsters in Bermuda and Turkey and Paris, raising branded claws in silent salute as the flames engulf them. The last remaining cameras going dark. Helicopters and fighter jets crisscrossing the airspace around and in front of Trump Sky Alpha. US President Donald J. Trump Floating at the center of it all, he pressed the automated descent button and the live stream cut out for a final pitch for boutique shopping experiences. Ivanka on video offering bangles and Donald J. Trump's signature neckwear and vacation ownership opportunities. And then back to Trump, full frame, at the wheel of the craft, another thumbs up to the YouTube live stream audience, to all those watching, those who still had internet, those still alive. And in the Situation Room back in DC, among and between all the generals and the members of the deep state, and now even Trump's private security apparatus, a certain humming awareness, a panic that they were watching, just watching the world end. And wasn't there something they could do? But there were too many, too many different strategies. They were each locked into their own roles. And Trump had already announced it, the big option right there on the live stream to the whole world, to all our allies and enemies and around the world, protocols and contingency plans were going into effect. Our allies and enemies were responding with actions of their own. There was just, there just wasn't any time, just no way to wiggle out of the moment to say sorry, to say stop, to say we fucked up, nothing to be done. Or rather, they could do the big one or just nothing. Sit passively, hemmed in by life and by all the possibilities. They couldn't quite dream into the real. And they understood that to play was to lose, but not to play was no real option, not anymore. And so it was the football, the gold nuclear codes. It was all initiated. It would start. Very soon, it was all just minutes away, the big event, the one we've been waiting for, for the better part of a century. The button got pushed. It was easy, sure. It really was easy. Now that it had happened across the Midwest and elsewhere, the missiles took to the sky as President Trump landed softly on the roof of Trump Tower, not listening for, but hearing nonetheless, somewhere far below, the oceanic roar of protesters flooding the streets of Manhattan. Hi, um, my name is Jen George. Um, glad there's so many people here tonight. I want to say thank you to Granta and um, Center for Fiction. And on my walk here, um, I pass Barnes and Noble, and Leah Michelle is signing books there. There, she has a book. So you're all here, and it's nice that you're not with Leah Michelle. So thank you all for being here. Um, 
I am going to keep this really brief. I just want to read this subheaded section from uh, my story, Revolutions, that is in this issue of Granta. Um, I'm not really going to give any context because it just kind of doesn't matter. I mean, it's, you know, fine. Um, so this is subheaded section. It's called The Passage of Time. There is some time. I remember the man and his time, his statements about time, the shortness of time, the way he thought talking about time meant anything. I'd had to remind myself of vows, convictions, and beliefs. I told myself the revolution frequently in order to stay, and I read and reread and memorized our books and pamphlets, righteous things of equality and the nonstop struggle, how to stay pissed and attack people who were wearing looks of contentment and in possession of many items or goods, which I did happily. My people, the ones I had come from, the ones whose physicality and behaviors had driven me into party arms all those years ago, wrote letters. We will pay for you to get out of there, they said, as though they had monies for bus tickets. The party and I would laugh at my old family entrenched in their system, opiated by dreams of monies and dentures and tall horses, and we'd burn their letters. My old family persisted. They sent envelopes stuffed with their approved credit card applications to show they had possible lines of credit in sums upwards of hundreds of thousands, along with catalogs promising new spring goods like floral dresses and sandals. They sent magazine pictures of men riding big horses and wearing cowboy hats. They sent grocery receipts from purchases bought on credit several item tickets boasting fresh produce and ice cream cakes. They sent menus from restaurants near the ocean with meals they'd eaten lightly circled in blue ballpoint pen. They'd say, the ocean is nice and we love the restaurants. They remained single-mindedly against the party's beliefs and actions that will inevitably encroach upon and then engulf their world. Thank you. Hi, uh, <clears throat> I'm Garth Halberg. I saw that line, too, at the Barnes & Noble, and I was like, is that for this? Like, <laughs> people are really... Um, so uh, it's somewhat inspired by uh, Emma Klein's piece in the issue, which is uh, set at a certain uh, to-be-nameless um, American clothing purveyor, and in light of certain promotional considerations. Uh, I'm going to actually read something that happens after the bit that's in this issue. Even at their edgiest, there was something nerf about the text messages, which intoxicated and frustrated in equal measure. How much could really cross the floating bridge between Cape May and Manhattan when, for one thing, she had no way of verifying he was actually in Manhattan, and for another, the messages seemed more like things bubbling up from inside the phone from this extension of her being. She thought of Magic 8-Ball, and sometimes of Eliza, the chatbot she'd spent hours talking to in fourth grade. The thing that made it real, the thing that seemed both the safest and the most unguarded, was when he used her name. She never liked it, this French word for pretty, which could have been a perfectly normal name in Lagos, her friend Precious had given her to understand, but not so much on the good old East Coast of America. When readers of rosters called her Jody or Julie or even Josie, which was a dog's name, apologies to any Josies here, she didn't bother to correct them. But Grayson, with his matter of factness, made it seem new and strange, a reference encompassing both the person she was and the person she was desperate to become. And was she pretty, that is? On the evening with her last night in Cape May, while mom took a valedictory dip in the pool, Jolie stood in the bathroom reconsidering. She'd always thought of her hair as mousy, but the sun had lightened it a shade or two. She pulled it into a brown knot atop her head and made in the mirror a face just shy of fish lips, then actual fish lips, then dropped the towel. Perhaps this way she might catch herself before the normal filters could snap into place, 
might see herself as she would have appeared from out there to a boy, she thought, though for a while there she'd wondered if she might be gay. Even at the store where she'd bought the swimsuit, amid the driving electroclash music that coaxed from Nana a series of decorous winces, she couldn't tell if she wanted to fuck the models in the pseudo-porn posters or be them. Maybe these were just different ways of chasing the same thing. Of course, that was how they wanted you thinking, the people who designed the store. And somehow, from the other side, Nana, too. Together, they made a soft conspiracy, a double-threaded screw. And when she'd pulled the claspless white two-piece from the bag back home, it had all the subversive effect of a deflated balloon. You couldn't help but imagine the 10,000 other 13-year-olds who were the obvious target demo, the 10,000 other moments of disappointment, leavened by the guilty awareness of the further 10,000 13-year-olds in Indonesia who had probably done the stitching, <clears throat> their headscarves, their dexterous little fingers coming so close to the machine. And so she hadn't even told mom she'd gotten a new suit. She'd continued to wear the same crimson Speedo she raced in right up till this moment. She double-checked the lock and looked back over her shoulder. The hips her thrift store jacket had helped to hide were not displeasing, but chest-wise, all the soreness of the last year had left her with a junior B cup at best. She was experimenting with some Kleenex from the vanity when mom called from outside the door. Honey, it's getting dark. We should go out to the beach to get a spot. Another thing about Cape May, they shot fireworks off not only on the actual 4th, a Monday, but also the night before when none of the tourists had to be back in the city for work the next morning. Grayson's text, when she told him about this, had been succinct. Send some pics? Just a minute, she said, trying to keep cool, but maybe overshooting and landing near annoyed. She couldn't remember if she'd put the liquor bottles back exactly as she'd left them. She thought she had, but what if what she was remembering was thinking she should? And herein lay the single biggest problem with Jolie's body. Trapped inside it, as she was, how could she be sure of anything beyond? This much did seem certain. There was nothing sexy about how the bikini top had to be rolled off like a wad of pantyhose, but somehow it fixed the trouble with her top half. She was just small enough to cover with one hand, to cover and sort of cup simultaneously. It was the display of modesty that was sexy. She held her phone at arm's length, lens turned toward her and slightly elevated for the best angle and pouted just barely and pressed the button. Honey? No, damn, a finger had been over the lens. She took several more quickly so as to have options and then reversed the camera to check the results. A knock. I really don't feel like watching this from the balcony here. I said just a minute. The picture didn't even look like her was the thing, but maybe it was like hearing her voice in a tape recorder. She didn't know how she looked. Maybe she was already a different Jolie Aspern than she thought. She swiped and clicked to send. Then she tried not to feel weird about what she'd just done. On the beach, though, she would hardly notice the fireworks going off above her. At first, she was convinced the response was going to hit her inbox at any minute. He seemed so literal-minded, and as far as she could tell, boys needed so little excuse. Her head was a swim with scenarios in which mom picked up her phone and started flicking through. And yet the failure of any crotch shot to arrive only created further anxieties. For one thing, was she that ugly that even an oddball like Grayson wouldn't reciprocate? For another, the permission structure as she understood it was mutually assured destruction. You gave them something over you, yes, but they gave you something over them, too. And finally, there were certain mysteries of sexting it would be a relief to get to the bottom of. Was the convention, e.g., to have his thing concealed by fabric or in the altogether? and then rampant or couchant. There were, in fact, four possibilities ascending in order of grossness from flaccid clothed to erect bare. So maybe she was gay after all. And yet the aura of gnosis of secret knowledge was itself a kind of exquisite anticipation. Theory of mind implied there were other people on this beach who were similarly occupied, shadowy heads conditioned by random intermittent feedback. Several people in her immediate vicinity, just statistically, were carrying on anguished extramarital affairs, or living a lie of sexual identity, or contemplating suicide. Yet she was coming to suspect that no one else had quite so much shit in their brains, or quite so hard a time 
just taking pleasure in the rocket's proverbial glare. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Greg Jackson. Thanks for coming out. Um, thank you to Granta and Anne and um, these awesome readers. I'm going to read something quite short. Um, this is from a piece in the issue that's a novella that was sort of excerpted. Um, and it's about an American uh, revolutionary, Maoist revolutionary, who's living underground for about 30 or 40 years. Um, so yeah, it's a barrel of laughs. Um, actually, no, it's mostly people arguing about economics. But I will <laughs> read. So OK, so he's going for a run. And he winds up stopping at a gas station and because uh, his knee is kind of seizing up. And he encounters a conservative gentleman. Closer to the mic? All right. I liked what you did. You got real close like that. Yeah, it's good. All right. <laughs> I'm too tall. Well, I like the mic drop. That's how I end most readings. But I'm not the last one reading, so I don't think I can do it. <clears throat> can I help you? Topple turned. A man held the door of the convenience store open, a set of keys dangling from the inside lock. He was roughly Richard's age, wearing an old shirt coined in oil. I was hoping to use your payphone, Topple said. No payphone, sorry. No, it isn't that. I was running, my knee. The man smiled, a trace of liquor on his breath. Bit old for running, aren't you? Topple couldn't stifle a grin at the way he hadn't meant it. Maybe, he said, all the same. Come in, come in. Beneath his impatient put upon air, the man didn't seem upset by the interruption. No cell phone, huh? Never caught the bug. I don't blame you. Government spies with those things, listens in on you, keeps track of where you go. My feeling exactly, Topple said. Rush says, they had passed through the small shop into the backroom office, outfitted as a tiny apartment. A coarse plaid blanket lay on the bed of a pull-out sofa, a hot plate set up on the counter by the sink held the saucepan. On the small wood table, Topple saw the unwashed dishes of the man's dinner and a few cans of beer. He smiled in grim recognition. Do you listen to Rush? Rush makes a lot of sense, but you know, he and I part ways here. Sure, you want the government going after terrorists. You won't hear me say otherwise. But do you trust them, really? I figure you give them powers, let them operate in secret. They're going to abuse it. Now, Martha says, Topple had the sensation of moving into a dream, someone else's dream. The physical reality of the space was as soft and strange as the curtains on the windows. Someone had put them there. Someone had made those curtains, everything. None of it was an accident. And in another sense, it was all an accident, the long playing out of accident. This was the cave in which lived one man's dreams. And men had been drawing their dreams on the walls of caves since they were men. Topple had spent nearly 30 years walking into rooms like this, not his own, halfway between reality and dream. Never his own room, not once, no phone. One bag for all his things. No tax receipts or bank card. No email address. A forged ID. A fake name. Not a few over the year, spinning through the carousel of safe houses. His letters posted from remote counties. Code words for the phone calls placed on his behalf. It was laughable, kid stuff. But there he was, indoors, avoiding windows. Everyone else had moved on. China was a market economy. The Soviet wealth had been looted by strong men dressed up as market capitalists. Castro would be dead any day now, and Cuba would turn into a resort town again, an investment opportunity for criminal developers, a recreation ground for Westerners with no interest or belief in history. There had been 2,000 protest bombings in the US in 1972 alone. Now if a smoke machine went off in Rittenhouse Square, they would have Philly on lockdown for 48 hours and martial law ready in the wings. Where did the rage go? How did it get absorbed and dissipate or transmute? What did it become? How did the character of an era come to be? How did it eclipse everything in its lurid actuality and then disappear without a trace? Thanks.
Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, can you hear me? OK. It's, it's, it's like really tense in here, right? We're like talking about like heavy shit. Um, so uh, OK. So my book just came out, and I got to plug it, because my editor will be mad if all these people are here and I don't plug it. Uh, it's called The Patriots, The Patriots. Um, but anyway, when your book comes out, you, um, you get asked like the same two questions. It's like, do you write with a pen or a pencil? And um, where do you write? And uh, like, do you have a favorite coffee shop? And I did have a favorite coffee shop, but I always felt, I'm, so, I'm too short for this. Can I like, adjust this thing? I'm good? OK. I did. And I always felt so awkward talking about it. So um, I wrote an essay for this about it instead. OK. Um, I'm not by nature an advanced planner, but I'd been invited to a literary festival on Saturday morning. So I'd gone to the mall the night before to buy my son's friend a birthday present. My next door neighbor, Puni, had less fortunate timing. She was in the toy shop when the gunfire began. She escaped to the roof and passed the remnants of a children's cooking competition. Somewhere amidst the wreckage of bodies and ingredients, she crouched under a folding table to aid a pregnant woman who'd been shot in the leg. When one of the terrorists returned, Puni would describe him as young, handsome even, like a boy you'd see lifting weights in the gym, or like the awkward teenage son of one of her friends. He looked her in the face, smiled, and aimed his gun. She shut her eyes. There was an explosion of yogurt containers above her head. Did he accidentally miss her, or did he mean to leave her alive to remember him and grow his diabolical legend? His phone rang, and the boy sashayed away. When he was gone, Puni scaled a wall only to find herself stuck in the concrete canyon in the unused rear of the building. She was rescued a few hours later, dripping in yogurt. A few, a few months later, she left Nairobi for good. For the next two years, I drove past the mall's arson carapace several times a week. I saw scaffolds, but no workers. In Kenya, I'd seen so many construction projects linger without end. It was a surprise, really, to pull up one day and find the glass doors triumphantly open. Glass doors. Next to them, a prim metal detector with a conveyor belt where women in conga skirts and hijabs were <coughs> uh, placed their purses. The marble landing was no longer sentried by, Ken by rail-thin Kenyan men in fatigues, but by plain-clothed Israelis whispering into earpieces. A twinkling fountain pool greeted me as I surfaced into a white afterlife sort of light, the kind of light you find in malls the world over. Everything looked the same, only fresher. I passed the coffee shop where I'd once eaten panini with friends and where that one Saturday people had tossed wallets and passports out of their bags so that if confronted by terrorists, their nationalities might remain unknown. The floor was packed. A group of Kenyan and Chinese businessmen had pulled together two tables to contain their meaning the sound of crying babies filled my own breasts painfully. A woman in a Danish accent was discussing the difficulties of obtaining foundation money with a Kenyan job applicant. The young waitstaff in their black jeans balanced trays of cappuccinos with those touching leaf designs in the foam. It was surprisingly easy to sit down and order an Americano. How can you write at that place? A friend asked me a few weeks later about the coffee shop that had once again become my office. It has good Wi-Fi? I said. It was only later that I, un I understood her question wasn't, how are you not frightened, but how are you not ashamed? I tried to counter with something about how if we allowed ourselves to be cowed, we were letting the terrorists win, but I knew I was parroting the political language that congratulated us for being good consumers. I would begin taking walks around the mall, searching for a plaque to the memory of those killed and finding none. No dates engraved in brass, no preserved bullet hole. But that was later. Now I had a novel to finish. My coffee was refreshed by a, a polite waiter named Vincent, who always seated me in the upper balcony in a grotto, away from the music and close to the bathroom. If terrorists walked in, I reasoned, I could run to the ladies' room and barricade myself in. But wasn't it better to be closer to an exit or in a semi-invisible part of the restaurant with no egress? It depended on the attacker's perseverance. What if others were banging on the door? Let them in, stupid. But how would I shield us from the hail of bullets coming through a plywood partition? I glanced at the metallic vase poised above the toilet. Or was it merely ceramic painted silver? To write fiction is to bestow a character with an array of choices and then, one by one, withdraw those choices. I couldn't separate my lurid fantasies from the fact that when I wasn't crouching on the common commode, I was hovering on the edge of another woman's life, a real woman whose story my novel was based on, an American who does everything to get herself to Russia and then spends the rest of her life trying to get out. Was it the torment of other people's experiences I was fascinated by, or the inescapability? 
the images in my mind were other people's memories, but I do have one memory that I hold on to. It was of the next day when I saw Puni on the playground. She was with her five-month-old daughter, bouncing the child around on the giant trampoline. She smiled at me, then went back to holding the baby's hand as the girl wobbled on the sheet of rubber. She stood up and fell, stood up and fell, convulsing in laughter every time. My neighbor's face was a naked reflection of that laughter. Where was she, I wondered, crossing this line and coming back again and again. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Karan Mahajan. Uh, I want to thank Granta for um, pulling off an amazing logistical feat and uh, producing 21 writers in, in one place, living writers. Um, and I'm going to read uh, a novella, a, pi a piece of a novella called The Anthology, kind of conveniently. Um, and all you need to know is that, well, it's a little meta. It happens at a reading, the scene I'm going to read. And um, everyone at the reading is killed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's set in 2000, and the guy reading is a, is a, is a gentleman named Jeffrey Turner. And um, the entire Indian writing scene is there, which in 2000 was a very small scene. And um, it's narrated by, so everyone is killed at this reading, all, all the Indian writers. Um, and the story is narrated by uh, a guy who wasn't invited, who's kind of a bad writer, but sees an opportunity for himself in this. <laughs> <laughs> There were two bombs, one decoy, one real. The decoy, placed at the back of the hall, made a long hissing sound and went dead in a puff of acrid smoke. Many of the audience members mistook it for a sparking fixture, a surge of electric magma from the substratum of wires that cushion our lives. Only an elderly professor sitting at a far corner was hurt by the soft shower of sparks. Jeffrey Turner, speaking from the stage, said, it's okay, it looks like a, a malfunction but maybe we should all get off the stage. Better to be safe, cello. But first, a couple of younger men came around to help the bleeding professor who had been knocked down into the aisle and was moaning, a hand over his left eye and fine specks of blood on his white hair. The others started picking up their bags and standing up in the rows. You could feel their relief about the possibility of being let out. That's when the real bomb went off. Everyone in a 20-foot radius of the bomb was instantly killed walloped by the heat on the one hand and a hard receiving ring of burning plastic seats on the other. The roof crumbled, revealing a low-hanging nest of iron rods and cements. A broken pipe gunned water at the dying men and women below. The rest of the audience, crippled, crawling, leaving trails of blood in their wake, reached the exits and finding them blocked, choked to death. Bombs make the most of the slightest material. They don't have the tragic range of earthquakes, which pummel rivers into flowing backwards and crank out sudden mountains from the subsoil. But they do set roads on fire, rip concrete rinds from the facades of buildings, denude bushes and trees in an instant autumn, and turn cars into impressionistic works of art. Bombs see the possibility in everything, and in this way they are like artists, improvisers except that they happen to kill. And so isn't there a strange poetry, you ask, in a bomb that kills artists? No. Afterwards, the seats in the theater were said to have looked like a garden of black, black singed cacti. The bomb was so hot and so vituperative. Only two men survived, a sovereign staff member who had been at the very back, sitting on his haunches, destined to lose his legs and the novelist Ismail Beg, who, as luck would have it, had stepped out moments before to answer his mobile. It is remarkable to think that an entire pocket of culture can be destroyed in a single day, but that's exactly what happened on 26 April 2000. Everyone died. Novelists, nine. Critics, seven. Journalists, six. Poets, one. Poetry was already dead. <laughs> Playwrights, one. Historians, four. Academics three, editors four. It was like one of Stalin's purges, but without the 20-year foreshadowing of communism that gave the more pragmatic intellectuals pause to escape to America or work furiously before their deaths. The result of the sudden massacre of talent was that when India, in 2005, suddenly felt itself to be a world power, 
It only had second-rate writers like myself and established juggernauts like Salman Rushdie to show for itself. The debut writers it launched, one after the other, was so slight, so inexperienced, so full of melodrama and self-consciousness about being Indian that they stayed in orbit for precisely one book before burning back into pre-verbal nothingness. When what should have happened is this. The men and women toiling in relative anonymity in Delhi in 2000 should have been rewarded for their work by the world's interest in India. After years of preparation, they would have been ready with their third or fourth books to present a national culture that was true, homegrown, brilliant, idiosyncratic, not derived from the West or pandering to it or dependent on it for acclaim and recognition. You you're too optimistic, friends tell me. Everyone sells out for the West. Or the bombing will put great pressure on the survivors to perform, and they'll write better than they would have. I agree that it is romantic to belong to a culture of survivors, but isn't a culture of survivors only worth celebrating if those who survived did so by dint of their wits, not a failure to land an invitation to the most overbooked literary event in Delhi? Um, I'm going to skip slightly ahead and just read one more paragraph, uh, which is somehow related to what we're doing here today. Of course, there was an anthology for the dead writers. And of course, it was to be edited by the one survivor, Ismail Beg. And of course, none of us, only the fucking, living, breathing future of fucking Indian literature, were invited to contribute. No matter, we understood, publishers must go through their emotions, even though the collection, Reading is a Response to Terror, 35 Authors Remembered, seemed by virtue of its title more a monument to the botched Penguin marketing campaign than the attack. How, we wondered, did they propose to unify a bunch of squabbling authors operating on such vastly different IQs, I'm looking at you guys, <laughs> and, in <so> many <laughs> and in so many different genres? So we decided to pass the time by working on an anthology of our own. Writing is a response to terror. 35 authors under 35 remember. <laughs> <laughs> The figure 35 was arbitrary but important, and now we were stuck. <laughs> Where the hell were we going to find that many competent writers in this blasted city? Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I echo sentiments of gratitude uh, to Granta, the judges, my fellow Boyan writers, and all of you here. Um, for being here. Um, so I'll read from my story, All the Cage Things. My name is Chinelo Oparanta. Um, the story is really about um, zoo animals, but um, it's also about an immigrant girl and about Americans. The building where she lived with her parents was in downtown Silver Spring on Rhoda Road, about a 45 minute ride from the zoo on the red line. It was an MPDU, which was the only reason they could even afford it. A one-bedroom apartment between the three of them. Her bed was in a carved-out corner of the living room, in a nook formed by a brown wooden shelf and a gray metal file cabinet. Every time she dreamed too hard and moved, in her dream, she knocked against the back of the metal cabinet, and the sound was like thunder thunderous sleep. At first, it elicited the amusement that often accompanies novelty, but now she slept rigidly so as not to be frightened by the thundering cabinet. Their 10th floor apartment had a laundry room in the communal hallway and a balcony overlooking Ellsworth Place with its bright neon orange and red and blue theater and store signs. Her mother sang praises every day for the next door laundry room no longer a trip to the basement or hauling a bag full of clothes to the laundromat across the street, the girl would have told her mother that other people in her school had machines inside their homes and that other people in her school had machines and housekeepers to do the laundry. No need to even fold the clothes, much less hunt for quarters each time the laundry day rolled around. But to say that would be to take away her mother's joy she didn't want to take away her mother's joy. For the past two years, every time her mother sang the laundry closet's praises, she nodded and added her own praises of the balcony, 
from which in the evenings she could look out beyond the bright lights of Ellsworth Place, beyond the tall, glistening metallic buildings and through the distant darkening sky, and imagine that she was back on Connecticut Avenue, Northwest, with the animals at the zoo. But of course, her mother would sing praises for such small miracles. Her father, too, sang praises, not for the next door laundry room, but for the place as a whole. Even as an MPDU, there was work, the work that they had to do to be able to afford it. Cleaning, in addition to the cleaning that her parents already did in the evenings as janitors at Georgetown, where they were also pursuing their degrees. Sometimes, those days when their classes ran late, they didn't get home until after she was already in bed. Not that their absence mattered much. Her share of the cleaning work pertained to everything except the compacting. Going from floor to floor, all 10 of them, gathering the trash from all the large blue bins in the trash room, throwing it all into the chute, sweeping and cleaning the room with her little red mop and bucket, bucket careful not to spill the dirty water. It wasn't the rank smell of the mop water or the tattered fraying threads of the mop head that she hated the most. It was the glistening cold emptiness of the room after she was finished. Once she found a doll missing a set of eyelashes in the eighth floor trash bin. It sat at the very top of the basin in a handmade boat created out of lined composition paper. In another place and time, in the world of flesh and blood, the boat could have been a capsized vessel and the doll a castaway. The girl whispered to the doll, like a fish coming up for air, a fish doll on a pile of trash. A fish doll capsized, a fish doll heading home, capsized, coming up for air. And then she debated to herself the meaning of home for the fish doll. Was home there in the sea, in that pile of neglected and forsaken things? Or was home here in the bland, transparent, vacuous air. Was home here or there? It was certainly there, a memory of a place that must have been brandished in the fish doll's mind, a place that must have seemed to have existed at least as long as she herself had existed, a simultaneous existence of body and place. Even now, when home was with her, home was still there. And if she had only an ocean to conquer, then one day she would surely swim back how long to swim back home? How long to swim across the Atlantic? Would there be dolphins or sharks to surmount? All that thought of home gave the girl a sickly feeling, the longing of something so out of reach, something she wasn't even sure she could any longer truly remember. She folded up the paper boat and then crushed it in the middle of her palm. She buried the lashless doll deep into the edge of a trash bin. Thank you. Hello, thank you for being here. My name is Esme Weijun Wang. Becky Guo, Becky Guo, won't you play with me? I can't, said Becky, I'm hanging in a tree. Becky Guo, Becky Guo, let me braid your hair. I can't, said Becky, I've died way over there. Becky Guo, Becky Guo, where are you today? I'm here, said Becky, and I'll remain until you pay. My toes are ice cold when I enter Wellbrook Psychiatric Hospital. I know without looking that they've gone deathly pale beneath my socks and shoes, as though shuttling blood to my vital organs will sustain me in this place that is not old enough to be quaint. Stained orange carpets, cement walls, cottage cheese ceiling. I think briefly of fleeing and how no one would stop me because no laser printed hospital bracelet has yet been clipped to my wrist. But I've promised to come and I am attempting to be brave. I approach the front desk while fingering the tin milagro that dangles from my neck. The receptionist raises her head and asks, can I help you? I'm Wendy Chung. I have an ECT consult at 2 p.m. with Dr. Richards. I see, she says, typing. That you do. Well, follow me. She leads me to a group of hulking PCs, seating me at one of them. You need to fill out these questionnaires before you see him. It's simple, but feel free to ask me if you have any questions. And then, you know, I love your hair. 
I put my hand to the top of my head as if to emphasize the location of my hair. I love how long and black it is, she says, just beautiful. I always find it upsetting when Asian women dye their hair. She goes back to her desk. I sit and look at the middle of the screen before me, which reads in blocky green type, please answer the following questions about the last two weeks. Press return to continue. I press the return key. The next screen offers me four selections. I do not feel sad. I feel sad. I am sad all the time and I can't snap out of it. I am so sad and unhappy that I can't stand it. I glance at the receptionist as though she can help me, but she's looking at her phone. She is perhaps checking the polls, which is what I would be doing if I weren't obligated to complete an intake survey. I examine her face. Has she voted? If so, who did she vote for? Please answer the following questions about the last two weeks. Press return to continue. The first question stymies me because I'm not here for depression, which is what the following questions are clearly meant to evaluate. Even a person without depression could answer, I feel sad for a galaxy of reasons. If this survey were about the election, I might choose, I am sad all the time and I can't snap out of it. Or even, I am so sad and unhappy that I can't stand it, which are both interesting ways of describing an inner turmoil. Who knows what we can and can't stand? In my opinion, I've been able to stand it if I'm still alive, and maybe my psychiatrist was wrong and I don't need this consultation for electroconvulsive therapy. On the other hand, perhaps I said yes to the consultation because I can no longer stand the voices and the visions. In terms of depression, however, sadness is not so much my problem, in which case it might make the most sense to choose, I do not feel sad. Yet, it is my belief that this could never be the right answer as long as I am alive. Wendy, a voice says, and I flinch so dramatically that I almost fall out of my chair. It's the doctor. He is white, like the receptionist. His glasses are John Lennon spectacles. His smile is bland. He is handsome in an unexciting way, like a bachelor on a reality television show. Out of the corner of my eye, I see glossy black shoes hanging, and involuntarily I turn to look at the nothing that is there. I'm sorry, I say, composing myself. His name is Dr. Richards. We shake hands with a grip. He says, come with me. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, my name's Claire Bay Watkins, and I also wanted to say thanks to everybody who put this list together. I'm particularly grateful that there are 21 because I'm the 21th <laughs> person. So thanks for making that decision. This is from a story uh, in the issue about um, my like boyfriend who died, basically. And I feel I wouldn't be doing an honor to his memory if I didn't use it to sell <laughs> books and <laughs> advance my own career. So I feel, like, I feel that's what he would have wanted me to do. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> I paid little attention to Jesse in high school because he was a rollerblader and I preferred skateboarders suspected him gay. I was 15, 16, 17, and didn't know how to spend time with a boy who didn't want to fuck me. Then all of a sudden it was August, and all the swimming pools in town gone mouth warm, so you didn't even want to swim until after sundown, and Jesse was back from college, and I was headed off to the same one in a few weeks. He was working AC, wrung out from crawling under tra trailers in 120 degree weather in long sleeves so his dad, the minister, wouldn't see the tattoos on his arms. We were at our friend Sean's drinking Budweiser with Clamato, Sean's dad made us. Or I come from, if you work, you drink, no matter that we were 18, 19 years old. By dusk, Jesse and I were alone in Sean's parents' semi-above-ground pool. 
I gave him a shoulder massage, his shoulders pallid, his neck and face sun-leathered, save for little white hyphens at his temples where the arms of his sunglasses rested. After the massage, Jesse said, in the voice of an animated luchador from a web series we all watched then, maybe you want to take your top off? And I was somewhere between willing and compliant. Down, we called it then, as in she's down, short for down to fuck, or DTF, which is what it said beside my name on the wall in the football locker room, Jesse said. Claire Watkins equals DTF. Inked as an insult, I get it, but I've never taken it as one. I was indeed down to fuck. I was curious, liked exploring other bodies. I also like to be liked, who doesn't? This is why I have no respect for rapists, Jesse said, cupping the white triangles of my boobs and glancing into the house to see whether anyone was watching at the sliding glass door. We couldn't tell, didn't care. Jesse said, girls are really nice. Most of them will do whatever. I told him that was because he looked like a white trash Ryan Felipe. <laughs> he blushed, turned the color he would ask me to dust across his cheekbones some mornings in the bathroom in the one-bedroom guest house we rented behind a halfway house off I-80. You just have to ask, he said. That's all they want. All consent is is asking. If you can't even ask, you're a pussy. You're using that word wrong, I said, lifting myself topless to the edge of the swimming pool. What, pussy? I pulled him close, worried about my stomach rolls. I had probably been reading my mother's copy of Our Bodies, Ourselves. You're using it as an insult meaning weakness, I murmured into his neck. The pussy, by which I assume you mean the vagina, vulva, clitoris, cervix, uterus, and ovaries, is the strongest muscle in any body. The clitoris has twice as many nerve endings as the penis. Jesse had freed his from his swim trunks. No, for real, that's what I'm saying. Pussies are tremendous. Also, I said, it's a term that belongs to a community, like the N-word. I can say it, but you can't. I pulled the crotch of my swimsuit to the side, and we kissed. I said, I can use it as an insult or in a reference to my anatomy. I can say, fuck my pussy, Jesse, or let's fuck, you pussy. <laughs> All this was mostly fun and uh, semi-erotic, though we rarely came, but it was also, of course, my survival strategy. You could question its efficacy since it made sweet boys afraid of me so that I always ended up with the crazies. But in this manner, I went from being raised by basically a pack of coyotes to an academic year on the faculty at Princeton. I sat next to John McPhee at a dinner and we talked about rocks and he wasn't at all afraid of me. Anyway, I didn't like sweet boys. I liked filthy weirdos and still do.